Hey, aloha, and welcome to Stan the Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Stan Osterman, formerly, and I say formerly as of this past Wednesday, from the Hawaii Center for Advanced Transportation Technologies. Now it's just little old me uh, coming to Think Tech on my own time and, and doing a host job. And I love doing this stuff. I, I really appreciate the feedback I get from everybody. And today, we have a really great show. I was fortunate in a, a couple of weeks, actually a couple of months ago, to be in Washington, D.C. with some of the other folks from Hawaii to attend the Department of Energy's annual merit review on hydrogen. And I met some great, great folks there that had great presentations. And one of the gentlemen I met is our guest today, uh, Dr. Uh, Franklin Tang Diaz. And uh, interesting gentleman, he's got an interesting background, and I'll let him talk about it, but uh, he, I think he kind of splits his work time between Houston and Costa Rica, which I, I kind of admire because I almost retired in Costa Rica, and if I wasn't living in Hawaii, I probably would have retired in Costa Rica. But um, anyway, Doc, thanks for joining us today. This is really an yeah. honor to, to have you on the show. It's a pleasure. It's a pleasure, Stan. Well, why don't you tell the audience a little bit about yourself if they haven't heard about you already, and, uh, and, and we'll let you get started. Okay. Okay. Well, as, as you said, um, I am originally from Costa Rica, another, another paradise, just like Hawaii. Um, very similar features, uh, volcanic, you know, beaches, beautiful oceans and so, so on. Um, and I um, always was, uh, you know, fascinated by space. You know, space was, uh, it, it was a, my calling from, from, from a very early age. Uh, and, you know, I was a, a child of uh, Sputnik, like many, you know, many people my age, uh, we were transformed by the whole opening of the space age. So I wanted to um, follow a career in space. And so in um, 1968, I uh, emigrated to the United States. I, I, I flew uh, to the U.S. Uh, as a teenager. I was uh, 18 years old and, and I sp spoke no English at the time. And I didn't have any, any, any money per, to speak of. Um, and so, you know, I, like many other, many immigrants to, to, this, uh, to this country, I just had to open my, my, my future, my way in, in, in this uh, great land. And um, I went to school, uh, learned English. Uh, I went back to high school. I had already graduated from high school. In Costa Rica, because I didn't speak English, I, I, I went backwards a little bit to pick up some steam and learn the language and, and got a scholarship to go to the university, uh, the University of Connecticut. That's where I ended up studied engineering. And all that time, you know, I am the space program, looking at the space program. And I was very fortunate uh, to be uh, starting my college career. Uh, when um, uh, Neil Armstrong uh, stepped on the moon, and I had followed that whole program from the from the beginning. Um, interestingly enough, that uh, at the time uh, that happened, uh, a couple of years later, uh, the space program was canceled. Uh, at least the moon program was canceled by uh, President Nixon at the time, and. Um, all of a sudden, we were immersed in, a, in an energy uh, crisis. Uh, that was an energy crisis of 1973, uh, when uh, the uh, OPEC countries began to curtail the export of oil to the yeah. Western uh, I remember world. that. That was when Major. they started having a gas crisis and uh, yeah. rationing gas. Yeah, so anyway, two, two things sort of kind of combined. Uh, one was the, 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 the cancellation of the moon program uh, and the opening of opportunities in the field of energy, which uh, also interests me. And I was studying engineering and physics. And of course, uh, uh, the space program was not really an option to, to continue on. Um, so I decided to go into energy, into nuclear power, and I went to uh, graduate school. I graduated then from uh, at the University of Connecticut as a mechanical engineer and as a physicist, and then I went to grad school at MIT and um, got involved in the fusion program, thermonuclear fusion, something very futuristic. I was always thinking that space somehow was gonna combine this, eventually it was gonna converge to this. And uh, sure enough, in the, in the late uh, 70s, uh, NASA 
began to uh, open up uh, again with uh, the testing of the uh, space shuttle. And, uh, you know, I always wanted to be an astronaut. And so I had become a U.S. citizen in 1977. And I had all the requirements. Uh, so I applied to the program in uh, 78. Of course, I was rejected the first time, like many others. I mean, there was nothing new. Uh, but I applied again in, uh, in, in 1979. There was another opportunity, and I was uh, selected in 1980 as uh, uh, a member of the ninth uh, class of, of astronauts uh, for the space shuttle program. And so I um, began uh, working at NASA uh, as an astronaut in training in 1980 and ended up spending 25 years uh, in the in the space program. It was, you know, tremendous um, for me, um, you know, the realization of a lifelong dream. I, I flew for the first time in space uh, in 1986 on my first flight, and I ended up flying seven times in, in space. I flew all of the space uh, shuttles except for the Challenger. Uh, and um, went to the um, Russian space station, uh, Mir, spent some time there. Um, I got involved in many, many of the ma major missions, and I helped build the International Space Station. So, I, you know, 25 years as an astronaut, uh, it was a, an amazing, amazing journey for me. And then um, all that time, I was involved in the development of a rocket engine that would be electric, an electric propulsion system for deeper missions into space. <clears throat> something that uh, would go far beyond the speed of a chemical rocket. And so that um, research uh, was ongoing sort of in parallel as I was doing my flying in space. And eventually uh, in the early 2000s, 2004, I decided that it was time for me to uh, move on to sort of my next goal or my next uh, um, you know, dream, which, which is to develop this propulsion system. Uh, and so I founded a company. I founded the uh, Adastra Rocket Company in 2005. And I've been since then uh, working in the field of rockets. And along the way in uh, 2009 or so, I began to diversify the company into the field of energy and hydrogen because, you know, I lived on the space shuttle um, on hydrogen fuel cells. And, uh, you know, to me, that was the future. That would be the future of uh, electric transportation on Earth. And so I wanted to try this uh, hydrogen economy and hydrogen infrastructure in Costa Rica, because Costa Rica does not have any, any uh, natural resources of oil or natural gas. And so I think the niche for hydrogen in Costa Rica is perfect. And is a country that um, you know, prides itself of having a very clean electrical um, infrastructure or hydroelectric and right. wind and solar and so on. So very similar to Hawaii in, in, in some ways, uh, I think. And in fact, um, my first um, uh, connection with the hydrogen uh, for real in Costa Rica was through Hawaii. I uh, came to visit uh, the installations in Hawaii and that's how the whole thing got started. So we're very interested and very happy to have uh, become very pioneers in in um, in the Costa Rica in Costa Rica and Latin America in the implementation of hydrogen technology. We need to do a, a sister state thing between Costa Rica and Hawaii. I think it, that'd be I a, a so. great adventure. I All think right. so. I think that would okay. be a good thing. I have two personal questions to ask before we get into, the, into this. And the first one is, where does a where does an astronaut in terms of thousands of feet? Where does an astronaut Space, space begins. How many thousand, how many tens of thousands of feet up? Yeah. Well, you know the, the typical the typical number is like a hundred a hundred kilometers, something like fifty miles up into in 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 the sky. Is that's where sort of the boundary, but there is no real uh, okay. definite boundary. No, I mean the the atmosphere just gets thinner and thinner and thinner, and eventually, you know, there's very little air, and you know, presumably back where you are in the 300 or uh, 350, 400 kilometers are altitudes for the space station. That is space, that, you know, you're, you're in space. 
I'm, there's I'm no asking, question about it. I'm, I'm asking to see if I'm in trouble from one of the flights I had in the F-4. Um, my, my next question though is, um, did you know Eileen Collins on the space shuttle program? I do, I, I do know Eileen very well. In fact, we trained together and we never flew together, but uh, we've uh, flown air, airplanes together. And uh, you know, she, she joined the program uh, when, the, when I was there, she joined a, a few classes later, but uh, a wonderful, wonderful person. Uh, very good, very, very, uh, you know, a person that uh, many men and women ought to emulate. I agree. He was yeah. my final instructor in T-38s in the Air Force. And uh, I've always watched her career. I know now she works for an insurance company. I won't say which one on the board of directors, but yeah, she's a great lady and I've always admired her. Yeah, so that's, that's neat too. that we have that connection. Anyway, yeah, let's, let's talk a little bit about energy. You mentioned that up in space, um, the space program uses a lot of fuel cells uh, in the space program. And I find it kind of ironic that most of the folks that I run into are afraid of hydrogen because they don't think it's safe. And I can't think oh. of a more critical environment that would prove the safety of it than in outer space. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the space shuttle, uh, all of the space shuttles, of course, relied on hydrogen. And we carried um, um, containers or, you know, tanks of, of liquid uh, hydrogen and also liquid oxygen, because of course, we don't have any, any air out there to, to bring oxygen in. Uh, so we carried uh, uh, oxygen and, and hydrogen, and we would uh, combine both <clears throat> in fuel cells. In the, in the, the space shuttle had three uh, fuel cells, and we produce uh, plenty of electricity uh, and also plenty of water. That was the other, the other thing that was pretty neat. Uh, you know, all of the drinking water for us uh, came from the fuel cells. And in fact, uh, we used to um, produce so much water uh, that we had to dump it overboard in many cases, and in some cases when we flew to the, you know, to the um, uh, Russian space station Mir, um, we would actually uh, collect water uh, before we would do the docking and um, have big bags, plastic bags full of uh, water uh, because the Russians always uh, were in need of, uh, of, of clean water in the, in, in, in the Mir station. So that was uh, amazing to me that, uh, that's, you know, water is such an important um, byproduct that uh, could be really used in, on, on Earth. Did so, you also, uh, did you generate hydrogen with electrolyzers or anything with solar power? No, or? no, we, we, the shuttle didn't have uh, the, the staying power, you know, the capability to stay there for more. I mean, the, the longest uh, that a shuttle could have stayed perhaps with an extended, uh, extended duration kit of hydrogen and oxygen would be maybe a month, okay. um, you know, curtailing and, and being very frugal about the use of en energy. But it was, um, you know, the space station right now does not use uh, hydrogen fuel cells. Um, they do have solar energy. But when we uh, operate on the moon, on Mars, uh, the water cycle will be critical, will be very important to be able to, uh, you know, to produce uh, hydrogen and oxygen to breathe and hydrogen to generate electricity and also um, both of them to produce water. So uh, I think uh, fuel cells are going to come back into the space program in a big way when we uh, deploy activities in, in uh, the surface of the moon and, and Mars and so on. So I tell you what, um, Dr. Tang, we're going to take a quick break here. And when we come back, what I'd like to talk about is um, some of the efforts uh, that you're involved in in Costa Rica to get their economy up on hydrogen. I'd, I'd really like to hear about that. We'll be back in Absolutely. 60 seconds. Okay. こんにちは。え、ThinkTechHawaii が日本語でお送りしています。こんにちは、ハワイ。ホストの国生かりです。え、毎週各週月曜日、え、2時からですね、日本語で日本語で活躍されていらっしゃるハワイのいろいろな方
Talking with Entertainers. We're here located at Think Tech Hawaii, downtown Honolulu at the Pioneer Plaza building and uh, in their studios. And so join me next month for Ukulele Songs of Hawaii. Hey, aloha, and welcome back to Stan Osterman and Stan Energy Man here on Think Tech Hawaii. And we're, we're actually coming to you live from outer space, if you believe the background. And uh, our guest today, certified astronaut, uh, Dr. Franklin uh, Chang Diaz, um, who also happens to uh, uh, have been brought up in Costa Rica, one of my other favorite places, but on my bucket list yet to visit. And um, I'll have to get over there sometime, and I, I think I will now that I know somebody now. Dr. Chang, thanks for being with us today, and let's talk a little bit about Costa Rica and, and what you're doing okay. in hydrogen down in Costa Rica. Okay, well, Costa Rica is, uh, you know, is a is a is a very small country in Central America. Uh, it is between uh, uh, Panama on the south and Nicaragua on the north. Uh, it is a country that does not have any. Um, energy resources uh, in the form of uh, uh, oil or natural gas. So Costa Rica from, from very early on uh, electrified its um, matrix, its energy matrix uh, with hydroelectric power. Uh, the country has plenty of hydroelectric power and it has a lot of sun and also a lot of very good wind as, as well. It has volcanoes as well, so it has uh, a lot of geothermal capability as well. Now, all of the transportation in Costa Rica is still fossil based. That is oil or um, gasoline or diesel, which has to be imported. And when you look at the, the total amount of energy that the country consumes, only about 30% of that is electricity about 70% of the energy uh, is uh, still imported fossil gasoline, diesel, naphtha, uh, bunker oil, and so on. Um, and so we want to change that. We want to move away from, um, uh, from, from fossil fuels in the transportation sector uh, and into hydrogen, because obviously the country has plenty of sun and plenty of wind uh, to supply all of its needs in, in, in terms of transportation. So that's what we're uh, set out to accomplish. A, the country is very small, it's only 50,000 square kilometers. It only has about 5 million people. It is a very stable democracy. Uh, it's one of the, probably the most uh, stable democracies in, uh, in the Western world, in Latin, in Latin America, certainly, for, for sure, uh, and um, is well-educated, uh, the country is well-educated. Um, and so, you know, I think the conditions are all uh, right, uh, the, the economic conditions as well, because price, the price of gasoline, the price of, of diesel is sufficiently high uh, to warrant uh, an alternative fuel for transportation. So hydrogen um, comes to that uh, level of equity um, uh, where, where it becomes interesting to, to, to apply it. So, you know, I think the niche is correct and we're, we're trying to do that. And you, you, how much of your power is produced by hydroelectric? Because, you know, the difference between wind, solar and hydroelectric is hydroelectric's a good firm a steady power source when mm -hmm. you know sun solar is not always available and wind of course is not always available and that becomes a big issue here in Hawaii because you know we we have solar and we have wind but we don't really have um, the hydroelectric except on the big island per se and uh, the only other natural resource we can tap into for firm steady uh, power that's also renewable is geothermal so how much of your um, yeah. your your energy is uh, is currently hydroelectric, and, and are you looking at geothermal for any of your long-term uh, baseload yes. power? Yeah, the, 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 yeah the, bulk, the bulk of the electric power is still hydroelectric. I'd say maybe 80 or so percent of, of that 30 percent, which constitutes electricity. Uh, you know, we're not talking about transportation now. We're talking just about right. electric, right. electric grid. Only about, I'd say maybe about maybe 80 percent of 
of that electricity is hydroelectric. There is a growing, um, uh, you know, infrastructure in geothermal power. Yes, uh, there's, there's a couple of big projects being developed right now. And of, of course, wind and solar as well. And more and more uh, people are, are beginning to open up to solar. Uh, the biggest problem in Costa Rica is the, um, the, the, the fact that energy is a monopoly. It's a government monopoly. And it is difficult sometimes to deal with that because uh, it kind of stifles a little bit the competition process of uh, the, the, the private sector. But within those parameters, you know, framework um, that uh, I think Costa Rica has uh, really been an example of uh, clean energy. Uh, in fact, there, was, there were times when the country was 100% uh, uh, carbon free, at least in the electric part. Again, I, I'm not talking about the transportation. Right. But, uh, you know, the electric part is still a, a significant uh, portion of the total matrix. Well, uh, Dr. Chang, I tell you what, we, we have your video. Why don't we show your video now and, uh, and give some folks a chance to brush up on their Spanish and their quick reading and, uh, okay. and see what's going on in Costa Rica. Okay. ¿Te gusta el bus? ¿Qué es lo que más te gusta del bus? ¿El qué? Muy buenas con el medio ambiente. La verdad es que nos llena de alegría ver que hay un cambio en nuestro país hacia la descarbonización. ¿Sabes qué tira este bus por la mufla? Agua. Agua. Solo agua. Yo creo que yo, yo, yo lo, que, lo, que, lo que más me, me enorgullece, ¿verdad?, del de equipo de Adastra es cómo le han entrado a este proyecto con el corazón. Esos muchachos se han, se han, se han eh, dedicado completamente de alma y cuerpo para el éxito de este proyecto. Ha sido difícil, muy, muy difícil. Hemos tenido muchos escollos, muchos tropiezos, muchos problemas. Pero estos muchachos no se, han, no se han amedrentado con eso. Han seguido adelante, han seguido con perseverancia y han logrado, al final del día, el éxito. Hay un conocimiento operacional que no se logra leyendo libros. Y eso nos ha hecho mucho más, más robustos, más, más capaces de de resolver problemas que se, que, que se presentan siempre en el transcurso de las cosas. Las cosas en teoría funcionan muy bien, en la práctica no. Lo que hemos probado hasta el momento es que sí se puede. Y se puede hacer. Técnicamente pudimos hacerlo. El equipo de Ad Astra, junto con los otros eh, socios del proyecto, eh, pudieron demostrar que un ecosistema de hidrógeno es posible hacerlo en Costa Rica. Aquí lo importante es que el costarricense se beneficie directamente con el transporte público. Una persona que va al trabajo todos los días y paga, digamos, eh, 500 colones para ir de, digamos, de la ciudad de Liberia a, a tal vez a trabajar al aeropuerto, eh, podría montarse en un autobús de hidrógeno y no sentir una diferencia financiera que no le cueste más, pero que va a ir, va a ir mucho más cómodo, va a tener un, un transporte muy, muy avanzado y vamos a hacerlo con eh, combustible producido en el país y sin contaminar el medio ambiente. Yo creo que eh, los costarricenses tenemos todos los ingredientes necesarios para hacer esto. Tenemos 
nuestra eh, materia gris en abundancia, tenemos un país pacífico, educado, con atención al medio ambiente. Lo que nos falta es quitarnos el miedo. Hey Doc, thanks for sharing that video with us. That's that's really awesome, and uh, and I, I guarantee you there's a there is a heck of a lot in common between Hawaii and Costa Rica. And, I think uh, so. it, it's yeah. on my bucket list. I'm gonna get down there. It has my two of my favorite hobbies: fishing and surfing. And, uh, so besides <laughs> besides hydrogen, it's got fishing and surfing calling my name. But uh, we've got about two minutes left, and I'd like to leave it all to you to just talk a little bit more about you know what you envision for Costa Rica in the future. And, are you going to retire down there or, you know, are you, you kind of going to go do the, the snowbird thing, go back and forth? I, you know, I, 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 I guess having flown in space, uh, you know, transforms the human being into a, a citizen of a planet. I mean, we, we don't even think of ourselves anymore as citizens of a given country per se, but more like a citizens of a planet. And I just kind of live everywhere. I live wherever anywhere this planet is so small you know you and i feel uh kinship and and communion with uh just about everybody so um i've been living in the u.s uh, for more than 50 years most most of my life you know i love costa rica i love latin america i love uh, i have chinese roots in my my, my background uh, european roots uh, well i mean you name it it's just a citizen of planet earth we so, use the Chinese term chop suey. Chop suey. Yeah, I guess so. Um, I think that someday, this is what I tell people, that uh, most of humanity will be living outside of our planet. Uh, and the planet, uh, Earth, uh, will perhaps be, um, you know, um, maybe a national park of humanity. Uh, uh, you know uh, uh, the patrimony of our of our human uh, of our human civilization, and that's why it's so important to keep it and, uh, and 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 take care of it and make sure that we don't mess it up. But eventually, most of us, uh, most people, will be living elsewhere, oh, and uh, the the earth will be the place to come to to see the beauty of where we came from. That's where we'll go on vacation, huh? That's right. Right. Well, Doctor, it, it's been awesome having you on the show. Uh, it's really great. And I definitely I want to have you back. But I know Mitch Ewan has a show on ThinkTech on Wednesdays. And he's mad at me because I got to you first. Oh, really? So he, he's <laughs> definitely going to have you on his Wednesday show coming up probably in the next couple of months. But thank you so much uh, for being on the show. It would be an honor. And um, I really appreciate you sharing some time with us. And um, we look forward to talking to you again. So aloha from Hawaii. And let's work on that sister sister uh, statehood thing between Costa Rica and Hawaii. Okay. I think it's a natural. <clears throat> well, in Costa Rica, we say pura vida <laughs> instead of aloha. <laughs> so okay. it's great. Vaya con Take Dios. Care. Vaya con Dios, señor. Igualmente. <laughs>